Okay, everybody. Thank you for coming back. Uh, sorry for a little technical delay. Uh, I've given this talk a few times. I tried to add a few more slides to keep it uh, not nullifying in your head. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of technical things. I don't know. I had a Methodist send a PowerPoint update about a month ago, on the Mac at least. So some of the very old movies no longer play. All the new ones still play. So apologies. There'll be one or two that just won't do what they're supposed to do. They did last year, but this year they won't. I think they just got overtired. Uh, so we'll talk about basically prosthetic valve functional imaging. <clears throat> Most of it will be um, echo-based, as is our clinical practice, but we'll talk a little bit about CMR and CT. Is this actually doing anything other than recording? Is it recording? It's recording, but it doesn't. It's not amplifying? Yeah, I don't have so I'll amplify. Okay. All right, so prosthetic valve functional imaging. We actually do a lot of that here, and it's fascinating. I've given this talk more or less for 10 years now, and I look at what we're doing now compared to what we were doing even five years ago. It's changed fairly dramatically. There's some basic principles. We'll go through that, and then we'll spend a little time on some of the newer stuff. So this is really the challenge, uh, and this concept keeps changing. So yeah, we're not doing any ball cage valves. A couple of those patients still exist. We're not doing too many of these. They still exist. Uh, we're doing more and more of things like this. That we're not putting in anymore, but we're on version two, three, and four that are bioprosthetic surgical valves that keep changing as well. So an absolute certainty is in the bioprosthetic valve field, uh, what you're used to imaging today will not be what you're imaging in three years. Uh, it's changing very quickly. So you can't ever really memorize all of the dynamic features of every prosthetic, every color feature of every prosthetic. You just have to sort of hang your head on some basic principles of flow, and that's what we'll talk about. Um, all right, so there are many, many valves. So we'll talk about how to briefly uh, review some of the current prosthetic valves in terms of their functional capacity, uh, and also some of the challenges. So this is the guideline from 2009. Uh, Dr. Zog, we chaired this guideline. Dr. Quinones certainly participated in it as well. Um, this is still the fundamental, and a lot of the early graphics I'll show you, the figures, the tables are all from this guideline, so if you've never seen it, you do have to read this. Uh, there are other versions of it that are getting very focused on post-interventions, um, catheter-based interventions, PVL, things like that. But in terms of the bread and butter approach to everyday transthoracic Doppler in particular, this is absolutely still the guideline that matters. Sorry, turn this off. Um, all right, so the basic approach, no matter what the valve, is to sort of think broadly. There's structural issues and there's functional issues. And Often they interrelate, but not always. Sometimes there's just a structural problem, and the function, as far as we can tell, is okay. And sometimes the function is abnormal when structurally we don't see what the problem is. Um, so it is important to think about every valve with this very simple approach. So the structural issues are the, the leaflets themselves, things below the leaflets, like a, a thrombus or a panis, uh, obviously vegetation, you know, particularly with Staph aureus. It'll destroy anything and everything, even close to the valve. So if you've never seen a fistula between two chambers, uh, if it's a prosthetic tissue of any kind and it's staph aureus, you can get a fistula anywhere. Uh, so there are no limitations. There's no tissue plane that gets respected uh, with a staph aureus prosthetic material infection. Uh, and then functional, the basic parameters are velocity of flow. Remember by Doppler, we measure velocity. That's all we measure. From that, we, in, we uh, calculate gradient. Uh, and from that, we infer flow. But really, all we're measuring is velocity. Uh, gradients, effective areas, and then regurgitation. So you, I've shown you these valves, the mechanical valve, the bioprosthetic valve, the homograft. Um, every one has a different f color flow profile. This is just showing that if you stop and get a good 3D color, it really depicts what the flow profile is doing. And this is something to keep in mind as you're measuring these things. So on a, on a mechanical valve in the mitral position, the far left, there's a narrow orifice down the middle. That's going to be high flow. Lateral orifices, orifi, or, or lower velocity flow. Um, the total gradient on one side of the valve to the other is exactly the same. So when the area is bigger, the velocity is lower. And when the area is smaller, the velocity is higher. Yet the gradient is exactly the same on both sides. That's how that works. Uh, OK, so mechanisms of dysfunction. Table you can read, thrombus, panis, endocarditis, hemolysis, which is you know, this is really the effect of the dysfunction. We actually see quite a lot of that. If you look for it, you will, will find even more. 
Uh, primary failure is incredibly rare. I know of one case so far that I've encountered at this institution uh, where a valve was implanted uh, on day two. It went in, normal gradients. On day two, the gradients were massively elevated. Um, the company got the valve. They refused to accept primary failure. And the final report from the company was there was a micro thrombi in the hinge point. Uh, so that's as close as I've ever seen to a primary prosthetic valve failure. Uh, and then pa uh, patient prosthesis mismatch, which we'll talk about. So uh, just look at this one. Uh, this is an aortic valve, transthoracic. Is this normal or abnormal? Well, we see a peak velocity just under three. Um, this is sort of, you know, this table that is, is some very old data. It's over 20 years old. Uh, one of the former fellows here with Dr. Zogby. Uh, but this is still some of the basic data that this is replicated in the guidelines, and this is what drives a lot of our concept of what's a normal gradient. The point of this one is to recognize that bigger valves on the far right are associated with smaller gradients. Small valves are associated with uh, higher expected normal gradients. So having no idea what valve is in the patient does make it difficult to just do a generic interpretation of gradient alone. Um, that's the bottom line. So, this is very important for the sonographers in the room. If you can get any data around the valve size, it's very important to give it to us. Uh, put it right on the header. Uh, AVR is useful. It's more embarrassing than saying, you know, AS eval, and then we write moderate stenosis, and then the surgeon calls us and says, I did a bioprosthetic AVR two weeks ago. You dummy in the echo lab, why didn't you tell me that? Um, sometimes it's hard to know. Um, so if you're taking the history, you're scanning the patient, and they present you with a card, it's very, very helpful if you write down uh, both the type of valve and the size of valve. Personally, in my view, once they've had a transplant, you don't need to keep writing that down. That still shows up on our reports. AVR, MVR, transplant, we don't need to see it anymore after the transplant. Um, but so gradients and areas uh, are very much uh, associated. We have this great measurement, which is a dimensionless index, which is really very helpful if it's difficult to derive an absolute LVOT area. So if the LVOT dimension is tough uh, and you are concerned about the impact of flow on your calculation of valve area, this is basically, it's a simple step up in velocity, the ratio relationship between the step up in velocity across that valve. Uh, we generally apply it to the aortic valve. It can be applied to the mitral valve, which I'll show you. Uh, but that's all it is, dimensionless. There's no units. It's velocity one divided by velocity two. The bottom right is uh, the gradient, or the, rather the ratio that we accept is uh, generally normal, above 0.25. But the comment here is that that is for a fairly old-fashioned bioprosthetic valve. It absolutely does not apply to any of the TAVR valves. It doesn't even apply to any of the current generation surgical valves anymore. So again, that cutoff was published in 2009 when most of the valves that we're implanting now didn't exist. So that's a moving target for us. In fact, 0.25 is very specific for dysfunction. Some would argue it really should be 0.3 for dysfunction. Uh, most of the TAVR valves, we're expecting normals are around a, a 0.5. So you really only have a 50% step up in velocity from LVO2 to, to aorta <laughs> across the TAVR valve. Um, along with the VTI, this is sort of the basic stuff. And this is, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because all this is all in that guideline. Uh, and this has not changed. And you've probably seen me talk about this before. But the basics, normal is on the left, obstructed is on the right. You generally want a nice LVOT that's traced. This is even a better trace than that one. You want it to look like it was drawn by a pencil, not by a spray can. Then you've got a nice laminar population of flow. That's a good quality uh, LVOT sample. You don't want to be too close to the um, prosthetic valve because then you get into the pre-acceleration, which therefore affects your VTI calculation and your valve air calculation. And then, of course, when you have, you know, as a general rule of thumb, if you're below 2 meters or even 2.5 meters on a normal EF, uh, then you don't have any significant obstruction. As soon as you cross beyond 2 meters, you have to start thinking. This is a very easy one for all of us, 5.5 meters. There's no scenario where that's normal. But as a general rule of thumb, if you're above 2.5 meters, start to pay attention, start to do some math, start to look at more than that feature. Um, the exception, of course, is your EF is 30%. You can have a very dysfunctional valve. Uh, and have a velocity less than 2.5 2 meters. Um, the other thing that goes along with not just the absolute velocity is the acceleration time. So how long does it take? The total acceleration time, but the uh, so total ejection time is beginning to end. The acceleration time is to the, to the midpoint, uh, and the acceleration time gets longer. So acceleration times, uh, you know, beyond 120 or so, 
uh, are clearly abnormal. So less than 75 is an acceleration time. Uh, that's normal. Beyond 120 is clearly abnormal. And then you have to sort of look at the vari variables in between. So this is the data set that from which we get that DVI of 0.25. So it's amazing when you factor that in this sample, again, from this institution, there was only four cases, the red ones, that were clearly and unambiguously obstructed valves. And they all had a DVI of less than 0.3, uh, actually less than 0.25. So that's what drives the cutoff in the guidelines, those four patients. Um, so don't be overly reassured if your DVI is 0.31 that there can't be a problem. Uh, there may well be a problem. If it's a very large valve and the DVI is 0.31, like everything we do in ECHO, you have to put together all the other stuff, the peak gradient, the mean gradient, the acceleration time, uh, symptoms, color flow, all of that. Well, conceptually, it can't be greater than one. Yeah. You know, and I've seen that in our reports. I've seen a preview with a DVI of, you know, one point one point one. I'm like, oh, I need to fix this. <laughs> Impossible. So where do you? Where do you? So I, I think it's even uh, 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 Taber valves. Uh -huh. Well, the first question is, what's normal? But everybody's got a little step up. So, yeah. you know, if I measured yours or mine, we shouldn't be greater than one point zero. We're probably around point eight. Uh, on a normal. We don't bother doing it on a normal, but you can do it on a normal. So normal's around somewhere around 0.8, I would say, plus or minus a little bit. Uh, Taver valves with a mean gradient of 8 would have a, a TVI uh, or DVI ratio of 0.7. Uh, in the trials of Edwards valves and core valves, the average uh, was, all, was always above 0.5. But that was all only up to one year, and they didn't include anybody who had valve dysfunction. So excluding all patients with dysfunction out at one year, you expect a normal to be around 0.5, at least. But if you're seeing a 0.9, be suspect. The, the, and it's usually the LVOT uh, sample that has been positioned too close to the prosthesis, and it's pre-accelerated. Yeah, good question. All right. So uh, that's the same cases. This is right out of the guidelines. Just some examples of uh, easy obstruction of an aortic prosthesis, easy to see. And again, it's not just the CW at the bottom where you have the prolongation, it's also the PW. The ejection time on the PW is also longer. Okay, so rough rule of thumb, again, uh, this is all assumes a normal stroke volume, normal ejection fraction, because these are flow dependent measures. Um, so if your peak velocity is less than three, mean gradient is less than 20, again, less than 20 is already outdated. Less than 20 for a mechanical valve or most uh, older generation surgical valves. Current generation surgical valves where the leaflets, like the trifecta is one brand name, Medtronic has another new one. They're fundamentally different because they used to have the three posts and the leaflets would be inside the posts. So the posts would actually take up some of the flow area. So the mean gradient expectation would be around 15 to 20. Nowadays, the valves are the posts they put on the inside. They wrap the leaflets around the outside of the posts, so the posts don't really restrict how much the leaflets can open anymore. Uh, so the mean gradients are more equivalent to Taber valves, so around 10. So if you were to write that today, mean gradient less than 20, I think that's a fairly specific, but it's not very sensitive. You can definitely have obstruction uh, and have mean gradients less than 20 in the newest generation valves. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, and then an EOA 1.2, that still holds actually for most of the uh, Taber valves uh, and the newest generation surgical valves. They generally have an EOA still less th greater than 1.2. Uh, they tend to be in most of the trials around 1.5, but as a lower cutoff, if your EOA is at least 1.2, you're probably not in trouble. Okay. Uh, and then the clarity of normal ones, velocities over 4, means over 35 easily, uh, DVI less than 0.25, EOA less than 0.8. This sort of rounded uh, AS profile, much just like a native AS, it'll, it'll look similar, um, and an acceleration time over 100. So that's sort of the extremes. You know, we have the very unhelpful category of possible stenosis. That's often where things end up. You have two on the right side, two on the left side, a couple in the middle, uh, and that's why computers don't read echoes, because we have to actually <laughs> try to figure all that out, and then that's. That middle category, if it's associated with symptoms, is often what leads to other modality imaging, like CT and MRI. So we'll come to that. From a Doppler point of view, because of that middle group being so common, that's why a change is very important. Yeah, yeah. So having access to serial 
data is very helpful. Patient comes from another place and you've never had anything before is yeah. much tougher. Than I mean, we accept probably the best echo for a patient with a new prosthetic valve is the one month because they're no longer anemic, they're not hyperdynamic, their volume status is stable, they're at an ambulatory heart rate typically. That's the most prognostically important echo. Uh, practically, it's very difficult to get that echo uh, back into our system to have it available for comparison. So we tend to do a pre-discharge echo, and it really should be pre-discharge. The ideal is the day before they go home. It's not you know, post-op day two in the ICU. Uh, that's an okay echo to exclude a tamponade, but that is not the echo that should be used for their benchmark. Um, so it's unfortunate that we get that too often. Uh, it really should be the pre-discharge echo. And not the day of discharge, because if you find a hemopericardium, which sometimes happens, <laughs> you've lost all that. So the ideal time for your echo is the day before discharge. Okay. Well, the ideal time is 30 days, but the practical time is the day before discharge. Okay, so what is patient prosthesis mismatch? Uh, it is not the idea that the surgeon kind of took the wrong one off the shelf. Um, that's what the name sounds like. Um, surgeons hate that name. Um, so it's basically the prosthesis, the valve is relatively small for that patient's body surface area. Um, one of the challenges is this concept really works well if you're a, you know, tall, lean, or tall and muscular, you need a bigger flow area. If you're smaller uh, and lean, you need a smaller flow area. So the two lean BSA extremes um, really affect the, the valve area you need. Um, the problem with this is that if, if you are, you know, 25 years old and your valve area is 1.5 with your prosthesis, and then over the next 20 years you gain 150 pounds, um, what's going to happen is your indexed valve area goes down dramatically, but the actual amount of, you know, flow that you need doesn't go up a ton because what you've gained is fat, which is metabolically not very active. So, that's one of the big problems with uh, patient prosthesis mismatch in indexing. The concept is very sound for lean indexing, big people, small people. Uh, it's not great for obesity because when you pack on 100 pounds, everybody's index goes down, but their requirements don't really go up. So that, that was uh, nicely discussed in this paper. Uh, it looked at overall survival. So if you look at the BMI uh, of less than 30, uh, and you diagnose somebody with severe PPM, the bottom figure here, they really did badly. So this is sort of true patient prosthesis mismatch. Hemodynamically important valve is too small. Whereas if their BMI was over 30 and you gave them the same diagnosis, outcomes were really no different. So that's saying the diagnosis is wrong and that's basically back to the indexing. So um, in Texas, I mean, if you're gonna call somebody with significant patient, patient prosthesis mismatch, just have in mind, how big are they? And if the echo doesn't show height and weight, that's a problem. That's why we need that parameter, is to be able to, to make this call. All right, and this is Dr. Q's point. So the post-operative studies are incredibly important, uh, and you get them uh, ideally when you can. So this is also out of the guideline. It's sort of an approach to prosthetic valve AS. Um, and this is a hierarchy of you know, what d data do you look at first. So you look at the CW, as we typically do. Uh, if it's more than three meters, that's flagging you that I got to look for other things. Um, if the DVI is um, normal on the far left, then you have to look at the contour. Is, is it maybe just a high flow state? Uh, if the DVI is very small on the far right, you're sort of leaning more towards uh, obstruction. And you sort of look at everything else. And this sort of just takes you through the algorithm. Uh, and sort of that's generally the, the approach to it is CW. DVI, and then you look at the CW contour itself, you look at ejection time, and, and that's how you try to figure it out. And then at some point, probably before all this, you have to factor in maybe the, the line before even the CW is what valve am I interrogating? That's really the first question. So this is what I commented on earlier, the mean gradients have really fallen. Uh, this is sort of, you know, mean gradients of even down to four, all less than 10. This is for one particular manufacturer. This is what I was talking about, how the valve leaflets, the struts, are actually inside the opening. Um, so great hemodynamics, uh, and I'll tell you, and you've seen these cases, now that we're, we've been implanting these for about five years, we're noticing that they tend to be getting into hemodynamic trouble. Now a bunch of them are coming back to us. 
Um, so there's always an expense with these innovative designs. So great hemodynamics, but the longevity, the calcification, the propensity to obstruction now at four and five years uh, is sort of becoming a concern. So this technology may not get the 15 years that we used to quote for a bowel prosthetic valve. But the early hemodynamics, at least, look really good. All right, and again, this is what I've shown you. This is just a, a slide of uh, a Sapien valves, TAVR. They're all about the same. The, the expectation of a mean gradient is around 10, so really very good. And DVI is generally over 0.5. So talk a little bit about paravalvular leak. Uh, this was a much more important conversation even just a couple of years ago. Uh, thankfully, uh, a lot of things have come full circle now to make this less of a clinical problem, but it's not gone yet. It's less of a clinical problem because all the devices now have these little skirts. This doesn't have one, but most of them have a little fabric skirt around the bottom, which gives a nicer seal. So that takes care of some PVL. The other thing is we used to size these initially off of, off of TEE, uh, first 2DT, then 3DT. Now almost exclusively the sizing is based on CT, so that's more accurate. So there's less undersizing, less oversizing. Uh, so when PVL is severe, or it's severe is absolutely associated with very bad outcomes. Uh, even moderate is clearly associated with bad outcomes at one year. Uh, there's debate if mild is associated with anything uh, that's important. So generally in the TAVR field, it's accepted if you have moderate PVR uh, at one year, you don't do well compared to those that don't. So that's a <coughs> philosophically, what does moderate even mean? If your outcomes are poor, then that amount of flow is actually severe for you. But we use the quantitation of moderate. Um, this is... We've seen this stuff, this is not new. Short axis, long axis, and 3D, showing sort of different approaches. The big challenge with most of this is actually the depth, because PVL can occur here, 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 and here. And if you only have one short axis, it's easy to show no PVL, because you've missed it by two millimeters. So this is where 3D imaging, and X-plane imaging in particular is helpful, because you can see a simultaneous long axis and short axis. You can find a jet in long axis, see where it's most prevalent, and then drop your short axis right through that spot. And that's when the short axis is useful. But just random short axis, so when you guys are scanning a, a TAVR valve and you give us one short axis, it's not very helpful. Now, this is one of the few places where a sweep is actually very helpful. If you show that short axis and you sweep up and down uh, and you demonstrate along the, as much as you can scan that there's no leak, that's very helpful. But a single still shot randomly along the short axis, it's hard to know that there isn't something else there. Um, okay, so, you know, the, this, the circumferential extent as a clock face is what's in the guidelines currently, and that is reasonably well validated in surgical valves. <coughs> surgical valves don't ever get as deep as this. When you have a surgical valve PVL, it's a little crescent because it's usually a single suture that's come out. It usually isn't a chunk of calcium because those calcium was all taken out at the time of surgery. So TAVR is different because TAVR has height to the PVL, where surgery tends not to have that. So in the surgical context, Circumferential extent was a little more validated. Uh, in TAVR, it's tough. We still use it, um, but we don't use it alone. Okay. And then we have a similar um, approach from the, this is in the guidelines. It really is exactly the same as what we propose for native valves. So there's no new hemodynamic criteria uh, for prosthetic valves that aren't already there for native valves. Um, and the PVL is what's the unique element. So this is a patient, and now the video works, so that's good. Uh, all right, so that's a, a core valve implanted, just showing a little 3D rotation. Uh, on the X-plane, this is what I was showing here. So you do a simultaneous long axis, and you sort of cut through that. You see a little hunt here, but when you look in short axis, it's a fairly good size circumference. So you need that sort of localization with X-plane. I uh, don't know. You can do explain with transthoracic. Yeah, so I mean, this sure, be, sure. For it's a reference in the room, this should really become almost a routine for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's not, uh, X plane or 3D is not a TE thing. That's that's that was it was present by transthoracic eight nine years before it was present on a TE. Um, but this is one of the things. So a mid esophagus view is a TE, and you see some. But when you go deep transgastric, you see a fairly more prominent jet. Uh, this is one of these cases. I don't know if the angiogram will work not working okay um, and this is something that's also become clearer is how useless um, pressure half time is and how useless aortic arch reversal is with PVL and TAVR patients 
And this is because they're an old population. They have stiff aortas. Uh, and people have looked recently, and actually there's a, there's a reasonable amount of reversal in everybody uh, over age 80. Uh, and so with no AI, you can have some flow reversal in diastole in the aortic arch. So where it's useful if it's new. So if you've got a good study before the TAVR and there's no reversal, and then immediately after TAVR you've got flow reversal, okay, that's PVL, uh, or, or it's AI uh, more generally. But if you, all you have is an arch reversal and you have nothing beforehand, you don't actually People have now looked at that. It's not a very useful parameter to say. It doesn't have the specificity that it does for a native AI. So uh, PVL after TAVR is still a challenge to quantitate. Um, I'll go skip this guy. For that particular case, the decision was that this, this AI was seen in the procedure. Uh, another balloon expansion was performed, and the AI was gone. And sometimes for a self-expanding valve, that's all it takes. Steve? Yeah. Now that we dip in here, have there been any studies putting aggregated volume to what we call subjectively mild or moderate or severe for BBLs? Have anybody attempted to do that or have even us attempted to do that? We're, we're trying. Okay. So that's the only thing we're doing now. Okay. So there, yeah, there is a publication from one of the Canadian groups where they looked at patients post PBL yeah. uh, or patients post TAVR and they found that you know regression fraction more than 30 was correlated with a bad outcome. And which is, is it's quite more aggressive than you would do in a regular native AI. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And probably because you know these are probably stiff ventricles yeah. Yeah, yeah. and their ability to tolerate, you know, uh, right. even a small amount of regurgitation is not yeah. as high. Makes sense. So that that's one thing and the guy and the mm -hmm. fraction of steady goes goes well with moderate. Right. It does. Right. So it goes back to what we're saying that a moderate AI already is bad enough for right. these yeah. old people. But it, what does moderate mean? Yeah. Moderate is gives you a bad outcome, then that should be called severe. <coughs> but it's the same amount of volume that in a 40-year-old with a bicuspid valve right. would means nothing. Yeah. Uh, but in an 80-year-old with a stiff, non-compliant ventricle. So that's one thing that the, the, we have not done well. Guidelines have not yet addressed, and the field hasn't solved yet, is how to index AI for the ventricle that's receiving the amount of fluid. Right. So we have to recognize that a little bit of fluid in the wrong ventricle can be hemodynamically significant. So this, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of publications out here. Um, this is one of, one of many. It's got some nice figures because it talks about some of the details and where PVL tends to occur, and it tends to occur sort of in these little commissural areas generally, uh, not exclusively, but generally does. Um, not in any one patient. You can't bank on it. But the graphics are good because it demonstrates one of the challenges that intraprocedurally, you know, if you compare transthoracic and transesophageal studies, um, and now more and more we're doing transthoracic intraprocedurally. You can absolutely look from a transthoracic and see nothing here at all because it's entirely shadowed. If you look from an apical view, you might show it, but from a transthoracic, you may miss that. It on a TE, you look from this side, looking up now, and all of a sudden on TE, you've got a lot of PVL. So there's, there's well-documented cases even in this lab where the transthoracic and the transesophageal, very different answers to the same question. Uh, and it's not because one missed it, one was right, one was wrong, or the clinical challenge of, is this PVL new? Did it just happen? Did the valve move? But more often than not, it's just recognizing there's a, there's a very real shadow effect on a transthoracic. That's the opposite on a TE, and vice versa. TEs can miss things, and then they show up on a transthoracic. All right, so <laughs> this is one grading scheme. I mean, it's, it's crazy. I think it's crazy. Uh, because they have, they, they, they parse the PVL into five different grades from trace using this clock phase all the way around to finally greater than 30% being moderate to severe. The reality is clinically the only number that matters is it moderate or less. Because anything over moderate these days, we're going to treat. Because we know that if, if we, so we say it's moderate and we believe it's moderate, we're going to either put another valve in or we're going to rebalone it or we're going to do something about it. So it's almost a binary discussion. If it's moderate, if it's less than moderate, we watch it. If it's more than moderate, we treat it. So these five categories don't really matter. Um, but they exist, and there's still lots of sort of an un-unified uh, area, I would say. All right. Um, so these are, the, you know, these are the challenges with quantifying PVL. Um, X-plane, I think, is very useful. Uh, when you're in the cases, the hemodynamics actually guide this a lot as well. So uh, mitral valve, let's change gears a little bit. Um, so the basic numbers, again. Uh, mean gradients of less than five in the setting of normal flow. Absolutely. Um, 
normal, uh, mean gradients over 10 in the setting of normal flow. Clearly those are abnormal. 6 to 10, so these are the same numbers that we use for native uh, MS cons considerations. Uh, valve area is less than 1, consistent with severe MS. Greater than 2 is normal. Um, pressure half time is challenging on a prosthetic valve. It's sort of, if it's very prolonged, it's suggestive but not specific. Um, you know, but I can't overemphasize the importance of the heart rate. And we've done some, some neat stuff recently in the cath lab uh, with prosthetic valves and a pacemaker. So if you have a mean gradient, uh, we had, somebody was pacing at 80, mean gradient was 9. We went pacemaker 70, mean gradient was 7, pacemaker 50, mean gradient was 5. So it, it exquisitely acutely sensitive to heart rate. Um, and the concept is, is really what is the pulmonary vein seeing? The pulmonary veins, that we're gonna, the pressure in the pulmonary veins is what the patient's going to experience. So it's not right to say that the heart rate is over or underestimating the prosthetic valve function or even the native MS. Uh, it's at that heart rate, is it severe or not? That's, that's the way you approach that. Okay, so uh, prosthetic mitral valve, just a couple of examples, a normal and a clearly obstructed mean of 13, pressure halftime prolonged. Uh, rarely do you get a very nice pressure halftime where you can clearly dis discriminate the slope on a prosthetic valve because generally if they're obstructed, they're usually also tachycardic. So it's rare to have a nice bradycardic obstruction. Um, and then you can drive an EOA. So um, this is just somebody with a clot on the left and post thrombolysis, the clot is gone, mean gradient acutely changed, got lucky. Um, this is something where the, 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 the DVI concept comes back. So in the mitral side, we don't use it a lot, but it certainly still works. Um, the idea here is that now you've got the proximal valve uh, is the mitral and the distal valve is the LVOT. So now you're looking at the ratio of flow from the prosthetic to the LVOT, and now you want uh, a small number. So on an aortic valve, you want a big number. You want your DVI to be greater than 0.3 and greater than 0.5 if you're a, a, a taber valve. On the mitral side, smaller is better because that means you've got greater flow in compared to the ratio out. So we don't use it a whole lot, but it's in the guidelines and it's there. Do you use this very often, Dr. Q? Yeah. 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 For this function, because it could be also with a mark. That's right. Yeah, so when you're looking at it and you see a gradient, and that's, that's a good point with mitral, um, Again, we see it a lot in the cath lab. If there's significant MR, that flow drives the gradient. So you can have a normal mechanical function in diastole with a big PVL jet that you're not seeing on a transthoracic, a lot of flow, high gradient. The problem is not stenosis. The problem is regurgitation. Uh, and this is, how, this is one of the ways to sort of uh, acutely look at that. At the end of the day, if you're considering this, you're probably going to get a TE. Um, but the approach is one of, if the peak velocity is very high, then you look at that ratio, uh, and if the ratio is prolonged and the pressure half time is prolonged, it's more likely to be stenosis. If the ratio is prolonged and the pressure half time is, is sort of on the low end, it's more likely to be regurgitation. I'm not sure how often I'd take that to the bank. I'd probably still do a TE. Um, okay, so we'll go to some cases. That's just, uh, that's again, a, a clear duplication of the native guidelines. Talk a little bit about this. Um, so prosthetic valves. This is a case of a mechanical mitral. I already showed you the sort of central high velocity and the lateral lower velocity in blue. PVL here, um, that sort of upper quadrant. This, is, uh, this comes up a lot actually, is what's, uh, what's a washing jet? A washing jet is a jet they couldn't get rid of at the factory, um, but basically it means that when the, when the leaflets close, they push a little fluid back and that fluid has some velocity and that velocity shows up on sensitive color Doppler. Um, and every valve has a different profile. We tend not to see anything but the one at the top these days. Very rarely will we see a Bjork Shiley in the middle <coughs> or, or a Star Edwards at the bottom. But this is a case I'll take you through. So the question is, is this PVL? I think this whole thing spools up. Okay. So that's pretty normal. You see these little crisscrossing color events here. Um, you see what looks like a pretty normal looking two leaflet motion on the bottom left. And then you see this, which I'd say is very hard to interpret. There's some stitching. Uh, there's a bunch of color. Uh, anybody think is this, those washing jets at the top, is that, is that, wa I call them washing jets, that color event, is it a washing jet or is that PVL? Washing jets, PVL. Okay, the room is split or quiet. 
Um, okay, so this is the question. And all we did there is we turned down the color gain and froze it. So what happened, washing jets, by and large, occur right at the hinge points. So those little bumps are the hinges. The leaflets are opening this way. And you tend to have the jets occur right at the hinging. So if they're all right at the hinge points, those are washing jets. Um, if it's way over here, that's unlikely for a washing jet. It doesn't make as much sense. And that's more likely to be a PBL. So location does matter. Uh, it's it's not too big to see too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you go back. We, we, uh, in the 2D, if you just fix your eye on the ring of the valve, you see that those jets are all inside those rings, not outside mm -hmm. the ring. Yeah, they and tend to of be. Of course, if you do multiple views, you can very nicely see that they're always inside the ring of the valve, not outside the ring of the valve. Yeah. So that's, for, if you don't use 3D, if you use only 2D, that's, that's your. So, so by definition, they have to be inside the ring, and usually they crisscross a little yeah. bit. They tend to angle towards the center. If they're doing that, they're not washing jets. Yeah. So they crisscross, they're inside the ring, and they're usually positioned near the, the hinge points. Okay. So that's one view. That's just it from a different angle. This is just showing that crisscross. So the aortic valve is rotated over here, and you see they're coming in like that. Um, different angle, the aorta at the bottom. So this is a different case. This is a 56-year-old with anemia. So we look at the mechanical function of the valve, top left. Uh, nothing looks too weird. Maybe there's a little wiggler over here. Is that showing up? There it is. But on the color flow, down in the bottom right, you can clearly see that large jet is outside the sew ring uh, and is too big to be a washing jet. So that's actually, you know, this is called moderate uh, paravalvular MR with hemolysis. So this is somebody who would actually receive a plug if the hemolysis was refractory, they were getting transfused every couple of months. Uh, this, uh, you know, a percutaneous plug implanted there would take care of that. This is somebody else. Uh, an older guy, he's got dyspnea, so he's got symptoms of heart failure. Uh, you really don't need the color here. You can see he's got a big hole. Uh, so there's the hole. There's the flow through the hole. Uh, all fast. This is a catheter that's transeptal. This is sort of mid-intervention. There's the size of the hole. Um, so this is the orientation. The aortic valve is at 12. The appendage is usually over here around 10 o'clock. So this is, this is a very common location for a paravalvular leak. This is really at the os of the appendage. So the annulus kind of takes a dive and starts to create this lower rim of the appendage. That seems to be a hard spot for a surgeon to get a good couple of sutures in. So that's, I don't know, somebody in here is a man. He's doing our PVL workup. Um, if we map out all of the spots where we get PVL, it's basically here, here, and here. You know, I would say 90% of all the plugs we put in are right here, right here, or right there. That's sort of the base of the appendage. Uh, and similar idea. So you can just turn uh, up the color filter. So it's real noisy at first. The image on the left is just the raw color. Same image on the right. All we did here was just turn the color filter way up. It gets rid of all of the smudgy stuff, it's hard to interpret. And then just pause it. And then you can see that the plug is here. This little event is a tiny bit of residual PVL. Uh, these jets are all little washing jets. Uh, there we go. And this guy here is probably a little residual PVL as well. So most of the time when they're that small, it doesn't matter what they are. But if somebody has hemolysis and you're trying to figure out what your target is to fix it, you have to figure that out. Yeah. But most of the computers you use around. Yes. Has anybody started to say like So in Europe they have a couple of uh, they're oval shaped. It's not easy to put a, a full crescent in because then you it's hard to orient that, but they in, in Europe they have some some uh, actually none of the devices we use, not a single one, is actually FDA approved for this. They're PDA occluders or they're vascular plugs. Uh, they're all every single one is off label. Uh, but in Europe they have what they're equivalent of on label devices is at the end of the day, it's not too bad because um, what is going on is the top is round and the bottom is round, but the neck is also nitinol and it actually conforms to the shape. So it's, if you, it's smooshy. It's smooshy. It's smooshy. <laughs> so if, uh, and you know, yeah, you're right though. I mean, I think eventually we'll put in oval shaped things. Yeah. The problem with oval, though, if it's oval, it looks good as it goes in like that, but if it ever turns 90 degrees on you yeah, after it's implanted, right, now it can obstruct the leaflets. 
So when it's a circle, no matter what it does, it's going to behave the same way. If it's not a circle, then you know a month later or three days later, if it shifts on you, that could be pro that could be a problem. Um, this one is not happy. This one, I'll take this out. This is just a big veggie on a bioprosthetic valve. You can see it there. It doesn't need to play. Uh, staph. This is I've shown this video before. Uh, six weeks of IV antibiotics and a guy who did not, the surgeons did not want to go to surgery. He didn't want to go to surgery. So this is one of the very rare instances. And I don't know why this video used to play and won't now. Uh, he got away without redo surgery on the bioprosthetic mitral uh, that was infected. The only time I've had that happen. Um, but he did not get away without scarring. So he has three distinct paravalvular jets after his infection. Uh, so chewed up a little of his annulus. Uh, does not have hemolysis. He's not of heart failure, so we're just aware of him. This is another application of 3D. You can certainly look at, this is an, a gross example across the top, is a St. Jude valve or one pop. It doesn't even open at all. Uh, and not surprisingly, all the color goes down one side. And we published some stuff a few years ago. You can actually look at that as if it were a vena contracta area and come up with an effective flow area. So this is a neat case. This is a gentleman with bioprosthetic valve two years prior. Comes in a hospital with fevers and chills. And, and this is sort of a fairly standard echo. This is done at our institution. Uh, not feeling great. This is a reasonable screen for uh, uh, endocarditis of a bioprosthetic tissue. Um, anybody see any concerns? If you see, I'll, I'll rephrase it. If you see a concern, put your hand up. Carlos. There's something wiggling on the, on the, the frame. Tape. No, no, like above the leaflet. The, the, uh, like, yeah, mm. yeah, so tough. In the shadow, perhaps, not very bright. Uh, it's a good pickup. Um, that was not picked up. Uh, that, this was reported as normal. Um, then he comes back yeah. a few weeks later. Still not feeling great. Um, now he's got this. Anything different? So what's different is that that thing you pointed out is a little more prominent. Hard to discern if that's leaflet tissue, but it's kind of bright and dense, and it doesn't quite look like leaflet. But this is a problem. That echo lucency right there uh, is the beginning of an abscess. Um, and that's where it's very helpful to be able to compare studies. So that's, and if you look back at this one now. And even there, you were. Yeah. I was going to say that, that area looks a little more thicker. It's suspicious. It's, it's suspicious. <laughs> so this I is actually, kind of tea that you would like to say, you know, so yes, I repeat in 10 days. And uh, you know what? That is what happened. Th this was the suspicious one. Th this was not called, but this was, this was recognized as suspicious. Yeah. Come back in two weeks on antibiotics. Came back in two weeks. Uh, has that now. So now that's pretty definitive. It's expanding on antibiotics. Uh, that's a new abscess. Um, in addition, he had uh, new, so in addition to that, the TE shows, and it's hard for you to see there, this is a velocity of f almost five on this CW. So he has a new stenosis. So that's an unusual presentation of a bioprosthetic valve with new stenosis, uh, and it's actually a big vegetation. Um, so this guy, that was all captured. Um, he was a very high surgical risk. Um, he had antibiotics for two months, and then a repeat study. And the gradient was better, so the, the leaflet mass was better, but the abscess is actually, you can clearly see bigger. So this is sort of the relatively unnatural history. It's not a natural history because he was treated, but he didn't get the definitive treatment. So the abscess is gonna be a big problem. And that's uh, evolving periprosthetic abscess. Uh, and there's kind of a neat application of X-Plane to seal, show the thing in, in two. But that's, that's as classic as an abscess gets. They can get bigger, for sure. But that's what absolutely what needs to be recognized as abscess. And this is sort of the natural history. This is not the same guy. This is someone else who presented later. This is how they get even bigger. This one is pulsatile. So what does that mean? And when it's pulsatile, that means there's a connection on one side. Usually it's the LVOT. So once, once this thing that looks like an abscess starts to move, then there's pressure getting into it. So it's usually an LVOT pseudoaneurysm. Uh, and then once it ruptures on the other side and it ruptures into the aorta, now you've got a fistula. Uh, so that's uh, still pulsating. You can actually put a seat. That's a nice that the color shows flow in and out from LVOT. There it is. Send for redo. Um, so, you know, TEE is appropriate. 
you know, easily. Anytime you're really concerned about a prior prosthetic valve um, clinically or, or, sorry, any prosthetic valve, uh, or if you clearly have uh, transthoracics to show changes that you need to explain. Uh, so a very low threshold to do a TE, particularly on a mitral case. I love it. So this, this one's working now. An hour ago, these videos didn't play. Okay. Uh, this one doesn't play. Yeah, maybe. All right, so this, so increasingly, we're actually asking our CT colleagues to evaluate subvalvular apparatus. Um, it's tough. I, I still don't know what the right answer is. We do it mostly to see leaflet motion. So if you see the leaflets opening fully and closing fully, then you know whether or not there's valve dysfunction, which helps you recognize if you have to maybe adjust anticoagulation regimen. Um, and sometimes we get lucky and we get a very clear panis, something like this, that we see here in the LVOT. Um, sometimes we don't get an answer. So I don't yet know, and maybe we'll be the ones to figure this out, if there's a specific contrast protocol, new imaging, new something that'll be uh, more definitive in giving us an answer more often. Uh, I get a lot of CTs for prosthetic valve dysfunction, usually looking for clots. Uh, it usually tells me what I know. Um, rarely it tells me a little more. Um, it's very helpful if we're playing an intervention, if we're worried about local extension of endocarditis and abscesses and fistula and all that kind of stuff, outstanding. Um, but most of the time, the most reliable thing you get from uh, radiologic imaging, whether it's CT or fluoro, is leaflet motion, and if that's normal. And occasionally you get lucky and you get a clear panis. Um, this is some of the stuff that's probably most exciting for a lot of folks, and it's, it's really changed uh, a lot of the clinical approach to transcatheter valves, at least, and, and increasingly also bowel prosthetic valves, is this uh, notion of subclinical leaflet thrombosis. If you, so if you do CT on a lot of people, which some of these TAVR trials are doing, um, and it's interesting how the effect of this, this, this absolutely killed perhaps a company, certainly a valve, uh, and maybe even a site, because this was a randomized clinical trial, nationally funded, uh, for one particular valve, the site said, we want to do a little sub-study of CT imaging within the, within the larger randomized, global, randomized control trial that was going on nationally. They did. They saw this finding. They had to report that to the FDA, shut down the entire trial. So uh, for many months, stock prices <laughs> plummeted. This is a very clear connection of, uh, so if you're a local PI asking to do a an imaging or any other functional evaluation of a device inside of another randomized trial. Your findings go to the FDA. <coughs> so that happened here. Unlikely to happen again in, in our generation. No company will allow it to do again. But the issue here is you can have the hemodynamics of these valves are so good that you can fully obstruct one of the three leaflets and have no effect on the gradient. So all you've done here is you've gone from an effective valve area of 2 down to an effective value of area of 1.5. But 1.5 is not enough, excuse me, to change the, change the gradient. So <coughs> these are really uh, asymptomatic functional imaging findings. <coughs> I'll let that play. So there is, a, there is actually an increased incidence of stroke. So this is a very active area of interest. Uh, it's interesting for us because we want to have more 40 CT displays. Uh, we're actually involved in randomizing some of our TAVR patients uh, to a CT sub-study as well. But it's not just TAVRs. Um, there's three different TAVRs on the left, one particular brand of bowel prosthetic valve. Uh, and if you look at a lot of them, they all actually have a certain incidence of clot. Clot, valve not opening, <coughs> sometimes associated with... Uh, uh, gradients and sometimes not. All right, so there's the algorithm. Um, if you are concerned about mitral uh, TE, very, um, you know, your your good TE imaging in a mitral greater than ninety percent of the time. If you're worried about aortic. Um, you usually get a diagnostic TE, you know, for functional change, sorry, not for structural changes, somewhere between 50 and 75% of the time. Uh, and if you're worried about 
uh, flow. So if you're, if you're concerned about a regurgent lesion that's been missed, I had a case, I took it out because the videos wouldn't play. Uh, but whenever you've got an enlarging LV, an enlarging LA, pressures that don't make sense, uh, we do CMR. And increasingly we do CMR for TAVRs, for bowel prosthetic valves. Um, often the same indication that we do for a native valve. When we're worried about AI quantitation, we're worried about MR quantitation, um, and we're worried about volumes uh, of chambers getting bigger and us having the wrong diagnosis or, the, or an underestimation of the valve dysfunction. We'll do CMRs. And CT uh, or uh, fluoroscopy, uh, when you want to see leaflet motion, typically of the aortic, but also the mitral. Um, so that's kind of it. So I'll stop there. My voice is almost gone. <laughs> uh, we're on time. Any questions? All right. Thank you.